Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for taking the time to, to drop in and talk about dogs. I, it's obviously a subject I'm really passionate about. Um, and my kind of main reason and, and goal for setting up this business was to help dogs and to help people and to help people have a happy relationship with their dog um, and to help dogs in, in rescue and to stop so many dogs going into rescue. So that's my main focus. I um, I set Charlie's Canine Care up about seven years ago as a result of rescuing my, my dog, Bertie, and him being so damaged and having so many issues and needing to learn a lot more about how to help him. So I went back to college, studied dog training, dog behaviour, and just was so fascinated and put in a lot more hours of study than I did with my uh, actual degree about 10 years previously. So I thought, oh, I, I think I need to carry on with this. Um, and yeah, I thought I could help other dogs and help people. And I realized how much there is to learn, even just sort of really tiny things about what food we're giving them and, and about how we're communicating with them and how much we take for granted and how we have so many expectations of what a dog should be and how a dog should fit our expectations rather than us understanding them and allowing them to be a dog. So it's been a really interesting journey. And from that, I've set up a dog walking business, dog training and helping people build on their relationship with their dog um, to, to make everyone a lot happier because we're all we're all sharing this space together, um, particularly during um, COVID. We've seen a lot more people getting dogs as well. So it's made things quite quite more intense and it's really important that everybody understands uh, a bit more about the animals and each other that you know that we share this planet with so that's 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 how I set my business up and uh and then I've got some other stuff that I'd like to share with you that I hope you'll find interesting mm -hmm. um, can I just ask as, as how many people have got dogs here I can't remember who it was just if you put your hand up or yeah <laughs> We've got a few. OK. Um, and some of you might be looking at getting a dog or hoping to get a dog in the future. So choosing the right dog is um, is a is a huge, huge subject from whether it's which particular breed or whether you have a rescue or don't have a rescue. Um, a lot of rescues have restrictions on ages and uh, how old children should be if you're having one of their rescue dogs so this kind of can inform people's decisions but there's uh, there's a lot of puppy buying going on at the moment and a lot of people buying from breeders who aren't experienced breeders unfortunately people are trying to make a lot of money out of dogs and there's something called backyard breeders and people that um just just want to do that really and don't really have the dog's welfare um as their their main interest and don't really follow up where these dogs go so the first bit of advice i give to people when they're thinking about getting a dog is to think about whether they want a puppy whether they want an old dog a rescue dog sometimes that can be easier not all dogs uh not all rescue dogs come damaged with problems some of them are really chilled out and they belong to people who can no longer have them for whatever reason or have become ill or or things like that so there are different options out there for rescue dogs it doesn't just mean that you're going to get a dog that nobody wanted um puppies it's it's really hard work and people don't always get that and I'm sure if you've got a dog you'll know how hard it is and it's exhausting and I haven't had a puppy for a while because I know how tiring and exhausting it is and I, yeah I don't think I've got the energy for it with looking after my own rescue dog so I admire people with puppies because it takes everything <laughs> that you've got all your patience um, and all your time um there's a lot of people that um, and there's a big trend, I'm sure you've noticed, for having uh, poodle crosses. So cockapoos, labradoodles, um, pomapoos. Uh, there's just so many and so many names for cross with poodles because people um, say that they want a dog that doesn't molt or a dog that's hypoallergenic. So I thought I'd debunk a few of those myths in that there's no such thing as a completely hypoallergenic dog. There's non-malting dogs, non-shedding dogs, and you may be allergic to the shedding, but there's also, you can be allergic to their, their saliva, to their claws, 
to their dunder. And I, I work with dogs, but I'm actually allergic to some dogs. So I take antihistamines every day. And even my own dog, when he's like sort of climbed at me, he'll kind of, I'll come out in like big rush and stuff like that. And some dogs will make me sneeze and like mastiffs and sharpays really make me itch. So it just depends, but, but you're not guaranteed with a poodle cross to get a dog that doesn't molt either and doesn't shed because sometimes they do because you don't know which bit of which dog you're going to get or how much genetically of, of each piece of each dog. So it's, it's a gamble. And what also people don't realise is that they cost a lot and take a lot of time for grooming because their coats grow and grow and grow and they don't stop. So you have to have them groomed and clipped regularly and which can be like every four to six weeks. And that can be about 30, 30 pounds each time. So it's not something to take on lightly. Uh, I call them, I call them doodle doos, the poodle, poodle crosses, <laughs> cocky doodle doos, because there's just so many of them now. And they're lovely and they're sweet natured, but it depends what they're crossed with. And they can be really high energy or they can be, um, uh, not not hypoallergenic as I've said so you've got to kind of go into this having a, a good look at what dog will suit you in in terms of that and also obviously in other things like energy levels and how much time you've got to spend with them all dogs need our time we can't leave them on their own they're social animals who want to be with us and that's how they've developed through time is by being our, our guards our partners with us being fed by us, you know, sitting around a campfire with us. And they don't want to be shut away or kept outdoors in a shed on their own. They want to be with us because that's that that's part of their job is to be with us and be part of our lives. And they are really they crave company and stuff like that. So that's a little basic bit into into dogs and maybe choosing dogs. I don't know if anyone's got any questions about choosing a dog or who's looking to get a dog and who would like some advice on that at the moment can i can i just as people are thinking i'm your explanation about to get in an adult dog or a puppy i think i certainly in my view it's always been maybe that an adult dog has been toilet trained and that's going to make things easier but in your experience what are some of the, what might a pitfall be? I know you've said that getting a puppy's tough. <laughs> what, are some of, what are some of the pitfalls in getting an older dog? So, in your yeah. opinion? Yeah, so an older dog might come without having been trained by its previous owner or not having had as much care as it needed. So it may come with health issues. So it might need medication. It might not have been taught how to walk on the lead well. It might pull. It might not have been toilet trained. So it, it does depend. Um, and it and it is, is just as easy to train an older dog as a puppy. So you can work with all of these things and there's no cut off date. They, I mean, it, you, they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but you can teach them and you can, you, there's no sort of um, start date for puppies as well. People say you should wait until they're a certain age, but you can, you can start again with all dogs and you can work with them if you've got time and patience. And sometimes it just takes a little bit more time if a rescue dog has been through stuff and is a bit sort of stressed out or damaged, it just takes a little bit more time and a bit more repetition to get it into the head. But puppies, it takes repetition as well. So some of the, the, the downfalls are probably the same with older dogs as they might be with puppies. So it just depends on the dog and you can obviously, if it's a rescue centre, you're allowed to visit hopefully soon again um, and, and test them out and see what they're, see what they're like. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? I, hello? Yep. I've got one more, Charlie, just about, yeah. and I know we haven't got time to cover everything. But no, we can just do this whole session just for you if you want, and about the way that you That's are a dog good. and, and yeah. help you with your decision making <laughs> process. I've been, I've been found out, haven't I? Um, it's about lifestyle. Is it about lifestyle? No, it, was actually, it was actually about dog types, dog breed. Yeah. And yeah. I know we talked about the poodle mixes, but again, going for a pedigree or going for, um, I, I, you have to forgive me for the right term, but like a crossbreed dog. Yeah, that, um, that's, that's the right term. 
in terms of um, you said about certain dogs have different drive levels and, and, and are more active than others. Is it easier if you go for a designated pedigree or designated breed to understand what that dog might be like when it's older or is it a bit of a is it a bit of a chance you're taking regardless um yeah it's all it's, it's always a chance because so something i try and help people get their head around is that our expectations of our dog are, are, they're quite huge and vast and 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 we, we expect a dog to be a certain way and we all have different expectations, but they're all different, the same as us, even within a breed, they're all different. So you can go to a reputable breeder of, of a Spaniel and you can get a Spaniel that's quite driven and hardworking and focused and you can get one that's calm, but you may get one that, that is so high focused that it needs to be worked. Otherwise it's gonna be anxious because it's not doing what it was bred to do. Mm. So it, it, it depends um, it depends on the individual personality, the same as it does with us. Mm -hmm. Every dog is different. You can, you can, you can guarantee a few types of, um, of, of things within a breed, obviously, and you know the basic kind of behavior you're gonna get from that dog, whether it, it was bred to sort of guard or hunt or do different things like that. So yeah, you can get a good idea by researching your breeds and looking into it and working out what will fit in with your life. But there's also a chance that they may not fit that type as well and they may be different. So you've always got to be aware of that. You, you're not gonna get a one size fits all for everything. And that's my experience of working with dogs over the years. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, I can uh, agree with that. With um, with us having had two schnauzers, you know, obviously both the same same breed. Um, it's like having two children. Their their personalities are different, um, and uh, you know, one, one was very very laid back, and uh, and the other one was was much more lively. I mean, he's now getting older, so he's, he's more laid back. But it's definitely the case that their personalities are different, just just like us. That, thanks for that. That that's a that's a really important that's a really important comment, and it's really good to hear it from someone who's experienced it as well. Did it surprise you? Did it shock you? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, look, looking back with uh, you know the difference between our, our first dog Benji and our, our current dog Marley, um, you know th there are common traits, yeah. um, but there there are also some quite marked differences as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, you you kind of think that they're say it's the same breed, so they, they're going to be very much the same. Um, but but you know it's it's like bringing up you think you bring your children up exactly the same but you're still going to get differences. So I think that's it's, it's a really great point. It's about managing our expectations of what a dog's going to be like, um, and it's not having huge expectations exactly about how they're going to be. So you can do your research into the breed, and then you might be quite surprised. I think it's it's having some knowledge and then also being open-minded about it and also looking at what you're going to put into it to make that dog a happy confident calm dog excellent okay thank you okay um i've got a couple of questions okay. uh, all right so i've had dogs when i was much younger um probably not very responsible with a dog it was just a pet that was it but now looking at dogs from now I'm you know thinking that um getting a dog is going to be a family member um if I was to get a dog I've got one in mind um a dog that I've always liked always wanted to have um Jack Russell so seeing um a Russell you get miniatures and then you get the Jack Russell itself would you say that this, the dog is the same I know that you've explained that dogs have obviously got um, personalities and everything, but across the board, would you say that miniature dogs are the same as their um, breed? So a normal um, normal size Jack Russell and a miniature, would it be the same sort of dog energy-wise? Um, it, it's interesting about genetics and breeding. And often when we've, like humans have... have sort of taken over that role of, oh, we're going to make this larger and we're going to make it smaller. And 
you've got to ask yourself why that's being done and if it was done for the benefit of the dog or if it's done for a, a working purpose or if it's just done because they're cute so you need to ask yourself what who which of the breed that breed's been bred with or if it is it come from a line of miniature i mean the, the, there isn't such thing as as miniatures in real life it's it's what the sort of human vanity has, has decided to do to make things look teacup sized or giant and and it always it isn't always in the best health interests of that dog to be bred that way so it just depends but um yeah it, it depends who the breeder is and where where that that breed genetically has come from a jack russell should have the traits of being a jack russell and a terrier will always have certain behaviors um but it's how again how you can manage those and work with your dog to make it happy to keep it enriched and keep it busy and doing loads of things that will keep it stimulated that suit that dog's dog breed so yeah it's it's, it's a difficult one really uh it, it depends on where where that dog is coming from okay if that, if that helps Yes, we'll, we'll hang up for the moment. We will try and give time at the end for any more general questions. We, we're going to give time at the end of each section for a couple of questions and then more at the end. So, Charlie, should we ask you to carry on to your next section? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me just quickly look back over my list. Hang on a second. So, OK, so say you've got your dog now and you're looking at toilet training because that's quite an important one. Um, we won't spend too long on it because not everybody's having a puppy. But some of the top tips for helping your dog um, and helping you with toilet training and helping your carpets and things like that, I would say, first of all, don't have a rug in any of your rooms. <laughs> <laughs> top tip, especially not any kind of sheepskin rug or anything like that. But rugs become like a giant puppy pad and a giant loo for your dog to go and have a nice little posh warm wee on, especially in winter. <laughs> so if you've got if you've got nice rugs, they're not, it's not going to work. They're going to be being washed constantly. <laughs> so that's my top tip, first of all, which I've learned um, through experience. Um, and everything with toilet training is, is regularity, um, reward and repeat. So basically taking your dog out, whether it's a rescue dog that you just had or a puppy, but taking it out regularly, you can even set a timer. So you can have that go off every hour and you take your dog outside and you let it sniff around and you hang out with it if it's nervous and you wait and see if it goes. And if it goes, you give it so much praise and excitement and you do a really happy, positive voice and you can give it a treat as well if you want to. And you can also mark the moment with a word or a hand signal or both. So, you know, you'll be hearing people across their garden saying, wee wee or whatever it was that you want to use as the word. If you don't want to use that word, you can come up with something else. You like sure? Toilet. <laughs> okay. So that, that's something you can do. And it's every hour and you take them out because their bladders are only tiny and they can't control them when they're young or if they're an older dog, they might not have been used to not being let out or let in or whatever. And also another tip is don't just leave your back, back door open if it's the summer to let them come and go as they please because as soon as it's colder and you shut that door again, they're not gonna have that freedom and they're not gonna have learned how to tell you when they want to go to the toilet. So always have a routine of you waiting, taking them out, because then eventually they'll go and stand by that door that you open for them because they're not daft. They'll go and stand by that door and you'll know and they'll, you'll get a signal or they'll come up to you and let you know that it's time. So you give them the skills by giving them the regularity and then they start to show you and you're if you watch your dog they'll be telling you things and if you spend time learning that you'll you'll see that they know that they want to go out so yeah regularity repeat and reward and that usually nails it and sometimes they forget again as well so because they're only toddlers so you have to keep repeating it even as they get a little bit older and you can go back to it like even after a few months when you think they've nailed it, they sometimes go back into sort of being toddlers and then teenagers and they forget. So it's always good to go back and start again. And Charlie, you know, in that time scale of an hour, would you extend that? So you start off with an hour and then do yeah. you go two hours or an hour and a half and, and kind of elongate it? Absolutely. Start off like that. And as they get older, they can hold it longer. And um, when they're puppies at night, they won't be able to hold it all the way through the night. Some people crate train their puppy and they put like a puppy pad in it and the puppy will go in that. 
um, which is sometimes essential for you to, to get some sleep, but it doesn't always teach them about going outside. So you may have to get up in the night with them usually when they're puppies. And then as they get more towards six months, you should they should be able to go through until sort of six o'clock in the morning. And then you're able to kind of stretch that time out. But their bladders just aren't developed enough to hold any of their toilet. They need to, to um, let it out physically because there's, there's nothing they can do about that until they're a little bit more grown up. Excellent, thank you. Um, recall is a big thing for people with their dogs and their puppies and their adult dogs so that we can decide whether we wanna let them off the lead in a public space and we need to be responsible um, and know that our dog will come back to us because we've got a responsibility to our mm -hmm. dog, to other people, to other people in the park and parks are really busy at the moment, especially it's making my job like quite challenging because there's just people are, that's the only place we can be is outdoors. So <laughs> everybody's there and there's a lot more dogs. So we need to try and get that glue, that invisible glue, that invisible lead between us and our dog. And it takes time again, and it takes patience and um, it, takes, it takes work, but you can start off small and set yourself up for success by practicing. You can practice recall in your own kitchen. If you've got someone you can practice with, you can do something called, I call it, whatever the name of your dog is. So my dog's Bertie, so I call it Bertie Tennis. So one person will be one end of the room, the other person the other, and you will call your dog backwards and forwards. So you're the bat and the dog is the ball. And you act really exciting when you call their name and they come to you. And, and they, you can do that backwards and forwards for a few minutes. And then you can take that further out into the garden and you can do it over a five meter distance, then a 10 meter distance, and then you can do it bigger. And then you can take it out into a park, but you've got to take yourself somewhere quiet to begin with. So there's less distractions because you'll fail if you set yourself up with a really busy park with loads of dogs and loads of people because they'll be so excited that they'll just want to go off and see everybody or, or see things, or they might be anxious. I'm worried about it so it's good to start off small get that bond and then build up your distance you can even start with a training line so it's a line that you can just a lead a big long lead that you can drop on the floor and you call they wear that and you can call them backwards and forwards and if at any point they get distracted and run off you can just put your foot on it and then call them back in and like yay and then you've got them back again so anything like that, you can practice for like five minutes a time on a walk, not the entire walk because it would be too much for them to take in at once. But if you do little time sections of it, they'll, they'll get that idea and they'll be able to, you'll succeed and you'll feel like you've, you're doing well and they'll succeed and they'll be happy as well. It'd be a positive experience for everybody. Has anyone got any questions about recall? <laughs> Some dogs will never recall as well, I should say. Some like a racing greyhound that has, uh, that may never be a thing it can do. And also like Spanish hunting dogs and some terriers as well. <laughs> it's not always easy to get 100% recall, <laughs> but you can try your best. Yeah, just, just to add, uh, I've got a, a one-year-old Maltese. He, he turned one last week. And um, I don't think, I think it's more us the nervous to um, let him off the lead. We've done it a couple of times, but on one occasion, um, um, I, I left my husband who was with him and had gone, I had to go and uh, pick up my kids. And he, um, after a while, he um, realized I wasn't there and followed my sense and my husband couldn't keep up and we could have lost him because he, you know, he lost sight of him because he was running after, after uh, myself. So I, I think we're a bit nervous to try it again. Okay. so. So how I would deal with that is, and, and that's a, it's a really good point and, and they will bond with us and they will want to follow you. And that, that can even happen with, with the dogs that I walk for my business. And, and if they see like um, another dog walker that may have walked them three years ago, who knows? So there's always that. So what I would say with younger dogs and um, especially when you're trying to get more confident about it is just to practice it for a couple of minutes at a time and engage with the dog while you're doing it. Once you let, let them off and just start letting them do their own thing, they're gonna get distracted or if they see you leave, they might suddenly get anxious or everything's changed. So I would always advise to, to just do it in short spaces of time, practice it for a couple of minutes 
and be, be playing a game and get involved with the dog. Don't just say, I'm going to let the dog off the lead now today. And I'm going to let it off the lead for the whole hour and that's it. So practice it in little minutes and do something constructive with the dog so that you're involved with them while that's happening. Does that make sense? And then if yeah. one of them leaves, you know, you can just, you know, you can pop them back on the on the lead for a bit and give yeah. them five minutes of something else until they've forgotten that you've left. And then, <laughs> yeah. and, and then rather than just going, yeah, right now we've got a dog and we're gonna have it off the lead and that's that. <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was a hard lesson to learn while we learned it. Yeah. So yeah, build up to it, build up to it, and 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 build your confidence with it as well, um, and so that you know that that recall is like really sharp. Always have really high reward treats with you. Mm -hmm. Always have something that's going to get that dog's attention if you've lost it. You need something that's smelly. You don't want dry treats that like biscuits that don't don't give off a scent. You want something that's a bit moist. You want like those evil cocktail sausages or Prince's hot dog sausages from a tin or some tripe or dry tripe. Um, there's different things you can use. Chicken, something that's going to cheese, tiny bits of cheese. You only need to have tiny little cubes of it. You can even mix that up with their dog treats to make it smell of cheese. Something that's going to make them go, oh, actually, I'll come back to you. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is a really a really high pitched and energetic voice full of energy to get your dog to come back to you and never run towards your dog while it's running away. What you want to do is distract it, get its attention and then run the other way and get it to follow you. So you could say, oh, what's this? And get its attention with a click and a noise. And then you could shake your treat bag and then you go, oh, what's this? Come on then. And I sound like a crazy person in the park when I'm doing this, but they will follow you. And they'll hear the rustle and they'll go, oh, what's going on over there? I want to go over there. This is amazing. And they'll all come legging it after you. So that's the way to do it. So panicking and going towards them has the opposite effect. So what you want to do is grab their attention, distract them, and then refocus them somewhere else. I hope that helps a bit. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Just before we move on, any other questions on, on, on recall, comments? I'm not taking over again, I promise. No, oh. no, please, please do. I haven't done these before, so I need a bit of like guidance. And no support. worries. What, <laughs> you've, mentioned, you've mentioned that some dogs are just not going to get this recall thing down. We know about terriers. Terriers have got that very intense prey drive, haven't they, where they want to run. But one of the dogs that I was interested in is, is called a Rhodesian Ridgeback, and I was speaking to someone in the park, and he said they've got two of them, and he said just forget about them coming back until they're ready to come back. So they will come back, but they're just going to go over there. And the more you try and get stressed out about it, they're, they're just not going to react. So, so he said, you just got to get it in your head. They will go over there and come back when they're ready. Now, that doesn't kind of work for me because I, I like you saying, I think it's important a dog is able to, to recall. But does that come back down to our choice of dog? Or is it just mean you've got to work harder with that kind of dog? Yeah, yeah, some breeds are going to be harder work and some in, some individual dogs within a breed are going to be harder work and it depends what stimulates them and it depends what's rewarding them. So if by not coming back, they're rewarding themselves by playing with another dog or chasing a squirrel or a bird or something they've seen or a sniff that they want to go to, then it, you've got to up what your reward is in exchange for that to to get them to come back so often it's like repeat um and that's when i say the five minutes off the lead and then five minutes on the lead till that you've got that bond and you you, you tend to know when you've got that bond with your dog because you can you can feel it you can sense it um and not all jack russells or terriers will will run off either you can train them to do that there's just certain breeds that may have been bred to hunt or chase where it's a lot harder once they've done that and they've been rewarded by by whatever that that might be a race or a kill or catching a rabbit or whatever that's when it's a lot harder mm. but usually you can work with it and you just start off by building yourself up to succeed once you start calling a dog and it's not taking any notice of you shouting and calling its name over and over again will, will never work mm. um especially if they're mid sniff so if you've got a really sniffy dog like 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 Dog to, Bordeaux, dog to Bordeaux, Rhodesian Ridgebacks, Mastiffs, things like that, Sharpays that love a good mooch and a sniff. 
it is going to be hard to get them. So you need to catch them when they finish that sniff and then get their attention. There's no point just throwing your calling at them because they won't, they won't always respond because they're getting the reward that they want already by sniffing that thing. So you do have to wait until they've stopped, then you can call them. But you've got to be careful with a dog off the lead if you have no recall over it because you, you're responsible legally for your dog in a, in a public place and in a private place now. So you have to be in control of your dog by law. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I ask a question? Quick question? question. Oh. Yep, we've got two questions. Kevin and Dad, do you want to go? Do you want Kev? Uh, yeah. Um, let's say uh, you're training at your dog outside in the park and all of a sudden your dog just runs and escapes or like goes to a child or something and you're recalling them but nothing's happening and you, you accidentally let go of the leash or something happens what would you do in those extreme circumstances like what what's a surefire way to like well, if, if you know that you've got a, a happy dog that isn't aggressive it's very different than if you know that you've got an aggressive dog in which case you probably shouldn't be doing that training in a park where there are children and you should be doing it more responsibly and using a fail safe mm -hmm. security method of not having a lead that you're going to drop or whatever um so that's that's the first thing that i would say but if if it's just a dog that's just like excited and playing and running off it it isn't always going to be if you haven't trained them enough that they will come back. So that's why the long training line is always good because you can put your foot on it. So that it might be like, you know, a 10 meter training line. You can put your foot on that and stop them before they get as far as that. But always keep yourself, at, your voice at beat and uh, high energy to come back to you rather than shouting at your dog and yelling at it. Because as soon as you shout at your dog and, sh and yell, it's, not going to want to come back to you it's going to want to do the opposite thing and keep going because if it thinks you cross it's not going to want to want to come back so you need to always have a security measure in place that it, it can't do that if you know your dog doesn't come back to you then you need to have a backup in place like like the long line and keep your treats on you until you know that you've got that bond and they listen to you okay thanks and dad, dad you had a point yeah, just a quick one, really. Um, we just noticed that with our Schnauzer, as he's got older, um, he's become more and more stubborn <laughs> and will and won't come back, or he's more stubborn about coming back, you know, on, on recall. And it's not that he's not heard you or anything like that, because he'll look at you <laughs> and then carry on with whatever he's doing. Have you noticed that, or is that fairly common with older dogs? Yeah, yeah, because they're because they're sniffers now. As they get older, they're less energetic, and they just want to sniff. So sniffing is the highest reward, and it's really good for them. Is he doing lots of sniffing? Is that what he's doing? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they know there's no urgency, and they're like, "Yeah, I can see you're over there. I don't need to come. What on earth could you have for me at this point that's going to be better than this sniff?" There's no rush here. I'm just going to carry on. I've assessed the situation. It's all fine. So that's what's happening there. So you might have to go back to a bit of like puppy recall, take out something really interesting for him to do, something that's going to be more fun than sniffing in that hedge or on that edge because there's going to be loads of other dog smells and whatever. But if you've got some other stuff for him to do, maybe we slip and we let our walks become quite boring and the walks become just about us walking our dog. And and we're just kind of ambling along and we're not really interacting with them or getting them to do anything. So they just think, well, there's nothing to do over there. This is better. But if you make something for them to do, maybe you do like take some treats out and scatter them. You bring up the excitement level. You might come back faster. You could go back to doing some puppy recall training by using those techniques, maybe. Thanks, Charlie. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, if we're good there, Charlie, again, next, next, next section. So lead walking, um, getting your dog not to pull on the lead, that's always a, a difficult one. I find this one hard. I don't do Zoom training in this because it's not something that you can do online. I need to physically show people and I'm happy to do sessions with people um, to help them with that because it's such a difficult thing. Um, and it hurts if you can't get your dog to walk nicely on the lead. And it's really unpleasant to go out and about 
one of the things that cause a lot of problems are retractable leads. They can cause more pulling than, than, um, than the good that they might do. You might think, well, they've got the freedom, they can just do what they want. But they get used to being able to pull a bit further and pull a bit further before the stop happens. So they end up learning to pull to see how much more flexibility there is on the end of this line. Um, and they can also be pulled out of your hand as well. And they can also wrap around dog's legs um, and they can and your legs and they can get tangled and they're quite dangerous. So I'd always say if you're practicing loose lead walking, do it on the do it on a normal night, like comfortable lead um, that you can have. And you have one hand through the loop, the other hand holding another bit of the lead and you practice walking with them to your side, holding that tight. But eventually you'll be able to loosen that. Um, and when they pull, you just you stop. And you can make a little noise like whoops and you can reverse into the other direction and as soon as they pull again you reverse back again and it's something that takes a long time like a few weeks and a lot of hard work but you can do it um if you put in the time and practice so it's it's one that i would like more happily probably show people but if you want to ask me questions i'll try and talk you through it because it's such a physical thing it's really hard to explain online <laughs> Okay, any questions on, on loose lead walking? Are you, are you suggesting, so when you're saying loose lead, so I've seen some people walking dogs with like a, a, a choker chain and probably for a bigger dog and they seem to have the chain very tight um, and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming what they're doing is to try and control that dog as best as they can. But are you saying that perhaps that's not the most productive way to do things? Yeah. So you're you're teaching that dog not to pull by causing pain to it and discomfort. And if it pulls, it's going to hurt it. Um, so it learns to stop through fear rather than choice, whereas we can teach them to please us because that's what dogs want to do ultimately is they want to please us so we can teach them to walk loosely by our side on a lead start off with treats and praise but you don't need to use treats the whole way through you can stop after you've you've got that far it's not saying that you've always got to carry all this stuff with you all the time once you've put in the groundwork it will it will see you through you might have to go back and practice it every now and then but using um chokes electric collars things like that you're not really communicating with your dog you might think you've got a bond with them but actually they're fearful and yeah. i think there's much more power to have a natural bond with your dog where it wants to do well to please you rather than to do it through fear and discomfort and pain some people disagree and some people don't use positive um, reinforcement and some people think that that's the only way to do it but there's, there's, it's a moot point. There's lots of discussion, but I, I think causing pain or discomfort to an animal is, is not the way to communicate effectively. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, it does, definitely, definitely. And you know, possibly, and I'm no expert, obviously, possibly it might take longer. But I think what you're suggesting is the more, it's it's the right way to go, even though it might be a slightly slower process, but more beneficial for dog and for you and for the relationship. Yeah, because you'll have a bond. Your dog will be listening. What greater power is that than the, the than your dog listening to you and having that bond where you know that it wants to do what you're asking it, but you've asked it in the right way. If you ask it by hurting it, you're not asking it to do it because it chooses. I stopped in the street um, a few weeks ago when I saw I saw a lad like being pulled along by a big dog. He was only young and he was being pulled and he was yanking it back and saying, heel and yanking it. And so I actually stopped the van and went, do you mind me showing you how you might do that better? And he's like, I'd love to know. And I thought he might not be open to it. I thought he might be like, who's this woman just pulling it? But he actually listened and it worked and he couldn't believe it. And he was really impressed. So I just want to change perspective and people's views on what, what can work and what, what you know, is, is not so good. Excellent. Okay. Thank Can you. I ask a question? Have we got time? Yes, yep. Yeah. Okay, so uh, not talking, I'm talking about travel with a dog in a, in a vehicle. I'm not talking about just sort of down to the park because you're going to take the dog for a walk. Um, you know, as far as going on holiday um, or, you know, 
on a on a day out, maybe a distance. Any advice on that? Okay, so you need to make sure your dog has a, a positive experiences from the beginning. And I'd start with short trips, um, going somewhere nice. So start off with a trip to the park. Don't just put your dog in the car for the first time when you're going to take it to the vets or put it in for a really long journey when it's not done it before. So start off with small trips um, with a nice thing at the end of it um, and work up that way. Work up the distance and the time until you've got a, a, a dog that's used to that and used to traveling in the car. You always need to secure your dog in the car. That's that's a law now. So you can get points on your license and get fined if your dog is loose running around your car. So there's different seatbelt harnesses you can get. You could put a crate in your car and put a nice blanket and a cushion in that and put your dog in the crate as long as the crate is secured in your car as well. Um, so that, that's something that's important is, is safety and for you as the driver so that there aren't any accidents. Um, but yeah, definitely start off with shorter positive journeys so they don't have to have a bad experience or feel car sick if it goes on too long to begin with. Because when they're little, they're not they're not used to motion and they're not used to vehicles. So it's best to start when they're younger if you're getting a puppy. Some dogs, uh, older dogs, it's much harder. And my own dog, even I I I can't, I, I put my hands up. I I can't I can't nail it with Bertie. I, he really struggles. Um, he missed out on all of the socialization in his life. Um, he was two by the time I rescued him and he, he really struggles with transport. He finds it really difficult and he pants and he draws and I've tried all the techniques. I've spoken to loads of trainers. I've tried medication, I've done everything and he finds it really difficult. So we know we have to stop regularly, give him water, um, ginger biscuits help him actually stem ginger biscuits because he's 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 car sick and he's, he's motion and some some humans are as well so it's not guaranteed but if you start them off early and start them off like positively you'll get a better response okay okay thank you we've got we've got 10 or so minutes which which okay. off the line at nine is there still a bit to do yeah, but you can ask me questions now. I'd rather just get asked questions. That's... What, what, what I was going to ask for the participants, are you okay? I don't want to elongate it too much. Are you okay to go to quarter past? Would everyone be okay with that? Yep. If we, um, I can see nodding heads, Charlie. So if, if, if that helps, yeah, there's a few fingers up, thumbs up, loads of thumbs up. You get in, you get in commendations. I don't think I've had this this much. I'll give some. I'm, I'm, I'm worried that I'm stroning on and on. I don't think no. I've talked so much since last March, and I'm worried yeah. that I'm just going on and on and on. No, no, that's like the whole point. On. That's the whole point. So <laughs> we'll, go to, we'll, we'll go to quarter past. So what we'll do is give another ten or fifteen minutes, or fifteen minutes for you, and then we'll give ten minutes at the end for any general questions if everyone's okay with that. Yep. So again, over to you, Charlie. Okay. So. Communicating with our dog, we, we, we speak very different languages. <laughs> um, well, our, our dogs don't speak apart from their bark, but they do, they do communicate through that. Their world is based a lot on scent and smells far, far more than our world is. We are visual and um, our all, I mean, they are too, but their main thing is, and we don't let them do enough of the sniffing and, and telling us what, what they want through their nose. So communicating with our dogs is, I think, going back to our expectations of what our dog is and what our dog should be and, and how they should understand us. And I think we, a lot of us may get into the habit of talking at our dogs, loads of words, loads of human words and language, and wondering why our dogs don't understand us, shouting no at them a lot, stop it. And all they hear are these noises on repeat for everything that they're doing, especially when they're puppy. No, no, stop it, stop that. So imagine what that would be like to be another species and just have this, this, this noise being shouted at you on repeat for everything you do. You wouldn't have a clue what you were supposed to do. <laughs> so I would say with training, to, to take out the word no, because we use it for so many things, they can't possibly understand what it means. We use it for jumping at that, for chewing that, for eating that, for weeing there, for going there. So we have to take the word no out. And instead of saying no, we give them something else to do instead of that. So if they're chewing something they shouldn't be, distract them and get them to chew something they should be and reward them for it. If they're going to the toilet somewhere they shouldn't be, take them away from that situation, take them where they should be going and reward them for doing it. 
And instead of shouting no, we distract, take them out and then reward the, the good behaviour. So that, that's a, a way that we can communicate. They don't know what we're talking about when we prattle on and call them millions of different names and all our little pet names for them. And they just hear all this. Like, and they can tell if it's happy and they can tell if it's angry and they can tell if it's stressed. So more of it is our tone of voice and our body language. And it's much easier if we just teach them like one word commands and hand signals that they can learn and follow. So instead of going, get off that sofa now, stop being naughty, that's really not going to work with a dog because they don't know what we're saying. So instead, you can call them off the sofa with a, with a treat, with something to lure them off with and say, this way, off. And when they get off, you can say, off, good boy. And then take them somewhere else to do something else with them so that they're not doing that rather than just going, stop doing that. Because <laughs> they're not going to understand us because they're not humans and they don't speak English or any language that we speak in the world, they don't get it. So that's like that's like a huge thing is and trying to get our heads around that dogs don't communicate in the same way that we do. They use very subtle behaviours and body language as well that that we don't always pick up on. So there's things like when they're stressed or if they're anxious about something, they might start by um, just looking on by the side slightly, a bit of a side eye and a bit more of white of their eye. They might then lick their mouth, their teeth, because they're slightly anxious. And all these things are like building up to them, telling us that they don't like what's happening or they're worried about something. So there's lots of things that you can study and learn. You can go online and find loads of things out about this. So you can be a bit more aware of what's happening with your dog and what it's thinking. So yeah, another thing is don't punish your dog for doing something wrong, especially not physically, but, but not even like verbally either, because again, they're just, they're learning through fear. So what you want to do is give them the skills that they can choose the right thing. So it's about helping them choose the right thing. So instead of doing the, the naughty thing, it's never, there's never a naughty dog. There's just, we're not telling them or asking them what to do properly in a way that they can understand. So if a dog's chewing, it's because it really wants to chew. So give it something nice that it does want to chew, that it can chew, um, rather than the thing it shouldn't be. Remove those things from, you know, from around it and give it a positive experience with a chew that it can have. And interact with it if it's bored, if it's chewing because it's stressed out or bored, you need to interact with it. And you, there's loads of games you can play as well that you can look at. Uh, I'm trying to think where I'm at now. Sorry. <laughs> well, just to reinforce what you're saying there, Charlie, I think you said earlier about making it more attractive to the dog when we're talking about the recall, you said make it much more attractive for them to do the thing you want them to do rather than the thing that they want to do. So, and this is the, this is the, the, the positive aspect of the training that you're talking about. Yeah, and it, you might not always win first time and you might not get it right first time and you might have to find out what makes your dog tick. By, by trial and error, nothing's, nothing's easy and nothing's like the perfect solution either. And everything is different for each dog and owner. But if you can find something that makes your dog tick and listen to you, then, then you can work with that. It might be squeaky toys, it might be a ball, it might be treats, it might be just you playing with it and, and hiding things for it to find. There's all sorts of things that you can do. I think our dogs get really bored. And I think a lot of behaviour stems from, from them not being dogs and being, um, there's, a, there's a word that's used a lot now, which is enrichment, canine enrichment. And it's about getting our dogs to be dogs, to sniff more, to do the things that make them happy so that they feel happy. And that they're not then showing behaviours that are stressed or, you know, damaging or whatever. Mm. Um, we, we've got this idea that if we walk our dog, we need to walk it around the block and we want to do that every morning and every evening and we're going to do a half hour walk and we're going to walk around the block and it's going to take this long and the dog doesn't have that goal. Our dog wants to go out, sniff the breeze, smell all the smells, smell the different dogs that have been that way, done all these, you know, smell all these other things that are going on, that are blowing in and out maybe and we need to, we need to stop and and sniff the breeze ourselves and remember that their purpose isn't to get around the block in 30 minutes. They don't care whether they've got around the block or not. They, they want to be happy. They want to, they want to be relaxed and it relieves their stress as well. Mm. 
So is it that balance? Because this, and I suppose this is all this dog ch um, choice process, you know, um, can we fit a dog into one, not only our lifetime and style, but also recognising what the dog needs. And I suppose what you're saying is, yes, there are times when it might be a quick walk around the block, but make sure that you're building in sufficient time for a dog to be dog like you would with a child. Give sufficient time for a child to be a child. Yes, there are some times when they've got to fit in our way, but we've got to allow them to be what they are. Yeah, yeah. So if you can't get around the block because your dog's sniffing, don't go around the block, walk up the street and walk back down the other side. Do something else if you've only got so much time in the morning before something happens. Play a game with them. They'll get just as much out of that as they will from just being pulled up the road or, or whatever if, you, if you're in a hurry. So there's loads of things that will make them happier. And most of it is, is, is keeping them busy, giving them a job to do, making them have a purpose and also helping them relax. Okay. It's a, it's a lot. It's, it's a lot, isn't it? It sounds like a lot. <laughs> can I ask but another question? To... Sorry, yes, can I ask yeah. another question? Um, within a family situation, is there one voice that they should be listening to more than sort of everybody or you know when I when I say one voice sort of um I don't know what's is the word in alpha just that this person is like okay I'm not yeah I'm the one that says you know about what you do hey, dogs like to look up to us for guidance because they're constantly looking for us to tell them what you know what to do and if it's the right thing they they do look to us for that for instruction but everyone can be part of that and if everyone has the same if you learn the same commands the one word commands and you have the same hand signals they should be able to listen to everybody in that way um, they may respond better to different tones of voice or sometimes the intention of one person so one person might believe that the dog is going to do as it asks more and the others might not be so sure so the dog will probably go to the person who's really sure of themselves and that might happen naturally it might not be that they're the pack leader or the alpha or whatever but it just be like oh yeah you you sat you 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 know what you're saying i i believe you i trust you so it's more of a trust and a bond thing but your dog can bond with more than one family member in different ways so it's more about our intention and whether the dog, whether our dog trusts us. Yeah, okay, Tom. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Okay, we've probably got time, Charlie. If, if it's all right with you, probably got time for another section if you've got one, and then we'll open for questions. Or do you want to just go into questions? Just go into questions. I think I'm okay. sure I've covered everything or not. There's probably loads. There's so much stuff, but yeah. <laughs> what, what we will say to people is that one, we're going to put Charlie's details on the screen. I'm going to do so now in the chat box. Um, but also, if you would like us, we obviously this is the first dog session we've had. If you'd like to have another one at some stage in the future, please let us know. Put some comment in the in the chat or contact us. If you've got a particular dimension that you would like us to 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 thrash out a little bit more in the future, then we can try and do that. But we've got we've got a few minutes. So any other questions either on anything that Charlie said so far or anything else that people might have a query on? Any other tips? Because I'm sure, as Charlie would say, there's no one expert in this. People people might have adopted yeah. their own approach that might work that might work well. So so please chip in as you as you would like. Got, sorry, I've got another question um, about rescue dogs the process of um, finding one. Okay, so there's, there's, there's rescues that will help you through that process. There's some that are more established than others. Um, well, ideally, they should all be supporting you to make the right match and the right choice. So never feel like rushed into a decision, um, particularly at the moment, because I know I know there's less chance to go and visit dogs and, and uh, interact with them. So make sure that you get to do that, really. Um, it's, uh, I know there's, there's waiting lists with a lot of them and, and some of them have quite strict uh, um, sort of rules on who can rescue and, and your working hours and the age of people in your household and this, that and the other. 
but the process they sh any any sort of responsible rescue should guide you through it and support you all the way through and also if you have any problems help you with that dog and if the worst came to the worst you know would have the dog back as well so it should be something that you can step into quite confidently and get supported through So there are centres, there are places that we can go. As you're saying, at the moment, it's difficult, but hopefully as things open up, there, there, there will be um, places where you can go and get much more help. Yeah. Um, there was one thing that I was going to talk about, and that was food food and treats. There's a, there's a lot more stuff out there these days, and um, there's a lot more knowledge that we can we can take on and find out about dog food and and diets and what are good treats and what aren't so that's that's a that's a huge topic probably and it would take a, a lot more a lot more discussion and i'm not an expert but there's like some basics that i can help people with and one is please don't give your dog rawhide or dyed colored rawhide to chew on because it's really really bad for your dog's insides and it's chemically treated and it's really nasty and I know it gives them something to do, but it's really not good for them. <laughs> when we're saying raw hide, is that is that a leather? Basically, it's, it's like it's it's animal skin that's been processed through chemical treatments and then like uh, through loads of things and then like made into all these shapes. And they use it for so many animal like dog treats. Um, you've got to be really aware of it. Read, read your labels for all your pet food and your pet treats, and actually read what's in them. And it should be you know natural animal parts that haven't been treated and your food should say meat or fish first in all of the labels and then the extra things afterwards. Anything that says chicken meal or animal derivatives, you don't know what you're getting and what's in that. And there's probably hardly any goodness for your dogs in it. There's like raw feeding you can do now, which is a whole other kind of, well, which is amazing for your dogs. And that's something you can look into. But there's obviously budgets as well, so not everyone can afford to do that or store all the food. But there, there are some some better quality choices of, of dog food around now. But yeah, please don't give your dogs raw hide. Don't give them those Christmas dog canes that are all dyed red and green and stuff like that, or things that are shaped like bones, and they're really not good for them. Could I ask a question? Yes, of course you can. Hi, Kathleen. Hi. Please ask Hi. Me. Yeah, it's slightly off beat, but do dogs smell fear, as in human fear? Because I only ask because I was once attacked by a dog and I love dogs. I love the look of them. I like, you know, I've got lots of friends who have dogs. And but there's a little bit of me that's still a tentative about being near dogs and um, dogs particularly that I don't know. But do they fear? Do they smell your fear? Um, they, they can sense sense fear through a lot of different things so they can read our body language they can see the tiniest movements it might just be us turning our head or moving our eyes they can see things before we've even like noticed we're doing them sometimes but they may you may be like perspiring more which they may be able to pick up on definitely that that's anything but not as in actual like fear they can smell different um pheromones um which which might be linked to that i'm not a, a full scientist on this but it's not just smell it could be all our body language it could be that we tense up and do this it could be that we make a noise or a sharp intake of breath it could be that we stare at them it could be anything so it could be that we're giving off signals that that make a dog tense up as well and then they do it and then we do it back and then you can get this like energy <laughs> that's going backwards and forwards because the dog isn't quite sure because they know you're not sure mm. so it, it can be to do with that mm. so it sounds like it, it, it might be difficult to do particularly with a previous experience but mm. almost to relax just to try and relax and yeah be there's things that you can do if you're nervous of a dog coming over to you um, and it's always obviously not not move quickly don't don't stare at it you can turn away you can move move your hands things that are dangling down and you can just be slow in your movements um, and turn turn away from a dog if it's jumping up you um, it's best to, to ignore in that situation um, but dogs can can detect I think from our energy and our reactions if we're anxious as well but I'm, I'm happy to sort of help or, or, and advise separately on this as well if someone's had a personal experience. 
Okay. It, it's I, worth saying it's not just fear that they pick up on. They can pick up on all of our emotions and they will respond accordingly. So, yeah. you know, um, if you are sad and you go into a room, a pup will usually come up to the person that needs a hug most. So, you know, it, it's nothing sinister that you've got to worry about. They pick up on our emotional needs. And if you've got a companion dog, they, they respond to that. So it's not just fear. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that, Rick. And I think that's the... Thank you. That's some of the, I suppose, the um, the draw for a lot of people. And I know it's an old adage, whether it's true or not, I'm not sure. But a dog is a man's best friend. And I think from what Ricky's saying, it's some of that, that they they know when you need um, a bit of support. You know, if, if maybe you're not feeling 100%, it's the head in the lap. And it's all those kinds of things. And it's that bond, I think you've mentioned before, Charlie. Having that bond is what really, um, that's, the, that's, that's what we should be striving for with having I, yeah it's yeah. the bond it's the bond that i think is the most important thing when it comes to, to training and, and to everything and, and to communicating with our dogs mm -hmm. and it's taking the time to listen to them and look at them and watch their behavior and learn as i said go online and look at different like body language shapes and different reactions and, and actually start to learn about them so that we can help them be calmer and happier or more enriched okay excellent okay a few more minutes any more questions or comments or points okay. I have a question. Um, I have. I've always had a dog. Yeah, because I've always had a dog. Um, but when I walk in the park, sometimes my dog's on the lead, and there could be another dog that's off the lead, and it runs towards my dog. What would you do in that situation? So, are you nervous of the dog that's running towards you? Because yeah. sometimes I've, I've never met the dog, so I just don't know. And it could be a really big dog. Yeah, and it, and it's not even the size that matters. It's yeah. it's just the situation that yeah. the other person really shouldn't shouldn't have taken their eye off the ball that long and shouldn't be allowing the dog to do that. But it does happen, and it's especially yeah. happening with younger dogs and and puppies everywhere at the moment. And it's hard. It's hard to manage. Um, if if you're nervous or if you think the dog is out of control that's approaching you. Um, I, I use my my body if I think that there's a, a situation arising or the dog might might be coming in too close. You can make a noise and stop and put your hands up. And I've actually done that and gone, no, stop. And the dog will like be surprised. And then I'll go, excuse me, can you call your dog away? My dog doesn't want to interact with your dog and they can do it. I've also, if I can tell the dog isn't being aggressive to me or showing any interest in me, but just wants to get at my dog. I've also put their dog on the lead sometimes and I've actually walked it back to them because they they weren't able to call it back themselves. But you, using using your body, if it feels safe to do so, obviously if it's an aggressive dog, it's a very different situation. But those, those incidents are usually very far and few between and don't happen regularly. Most of the time it's a dog that just wants to run over and, and say hello and have a sniff and run off again. Um, so I would body block if I was really worried. Um, and I would also, if I could see it wasn't being aggressive, I would just try it, try and relax, let the dog sniff. Then most of the time they'll work it out themselves. Um, it's very rare that you'll have a full on incident. If you if you do have something you're concerned about, I would get will call over to the owner and ask them to get the dog back on the lead. OK, okay. thank you. Thank, thanks for the question, Sharon. Theo, I'm not sure if I've seen you. Theo, are you, were you going to ask a question? Yeah, I'm here still. Um, yeah, so. My question being is, um, what's your thoughts on somebody getting a puppy, but they work full time pretty much, so they're out of the house um, for a number of hours? Really? Is there a set time that a puppy should be sort of left for or not at all? P puppies, I wouldn't be leaving much at all to begin with. And then you would build it up for like, you know, half an hour, an hour and, and yeah. so on. And it would never be more than four hours, even for an adult dog. As I said, okay. they're like, they're companion creatures. Puppies have, will have been with their mum and their siblings and then suddenly to take them away from that and then you go off and leave them for four hours would, would probably create separation anxiety, a lot of frustration yes. and behavioural problems. It's something you'd need to build up to very slowly. So if you know that you've, you've got, you're going to be getting a puppy, having nobody around for that puppy would, would be really difficult. You can get dog walkers and puppy visits and things like that, but even then they need to be regular mm -hmm. and they need to be frequent enough that that puppy will be happy and feel, feel secure. Mm -hmm. So you would... 
So you would start off, maybe you would leave your, your puppy for like half an hour and then you would do an hour. And if you were going out for an hour or two hours, you might have someone to come in and sit with it or play with it or let it out to the toilet. Because again, it might not be able to hold, depending on how old it is, it wouldn't be able to, to hold its toilet that long as well. So it's not yes. fair for it. Okay, thank you. Good question, Theo. Thank you. And how long might that go on for, Charlie? I know each dog is a bit different and might mature differently. But until you got to the stage where you're saying an adult dog leave it for four hours, is that when a dog yeah. six months old, nine months old, or is it a bit? I more? mean, you, you, your dog's still a puppy up until you know it can be up to eighteen months, depending on how it develops. They all develop differently, and it will depend on in individuality as well and how much they can handle. Mm. Um, and, and again, all of them are different. But you, you can build this into your training um, so that they get more comfortable being left. Mm. Um, an adult dog would be sort of from 18 months onwards maybe but it, it's all individual i'm not i'm not like the, the pro expert on everything it is yeah. kind of trial it out but you definitely need to be around for a young dog as much as you can and have people that can help you out with that if you can't be there all of the time you've got to be realistic you can't have like a, a nine month old Dalmatian running loose in a house from eight o'clock in the morning until four o'clock in the afternoon with nobody going in because you're going to get a really stressed out, anxious dog and loads of like damage and it might hurt itself and it'll bark and it'll be really worried. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, we've got time for maybe one, two more questions at the most. Any other burning questions or comments? I've got one quick quest okay, question. Okay, yes, please. Yeah. Um, I just wonder what your thoughts are, Charlie, on um, muzzles, because we we we've got a um, um, our puppy who seems to be going through a, a phase of uh, nipping at other dogs. So um, it it happened. It started from about six months, I guess, when he he started puberty. We've had him castrated, but he's still. Um, nips at other dogs you know after that initial sniff so, so it, when you say nip goes in for a, a little bite yes yes right. at the face so he, he's fine if he has a little sniff first at, at the behind he seems to be happy enough he'll either go his own way or have a little play but if they if they're in his face um too long he will nip at them so but is it a snap that goes next to their face or is it is he actually making contact and biting? Yeah, he seems to make things. contact and, and we're, we're nervous of him hurting the other dog. So I think it, it's creating a bit of tension. So we're, we're pulling back on him even before. And it's making it worse. I yeah. Think I, I, to, to, I wouldn't want to advise on that over, yeah. over Zoom like this. It's something that would need to be observed. Um, mm. I can do training, but if it, you know, I, I need to see what's happening. Right. to read the, the, the situation and see what the body language and see if he's playing or if he's being aggressive or it's very yeah. hard for me to tell from that and I wouldn't want to sort of do it by zoom but I'm happy to you know to chat afterwards or another time okay yeah, yeah. we wondered if he was you know nervous or or feeling threatened he, he, he might be but again I can't I can't see what what his his behavior is while he's doing it so i'd have to i'd have to see that in motion and to see what was happening to give some proper advice i wouldn't wouldn't want to advise you otherwise okay no no that's fine but i am more than happy to chat okay sure thanks uh, we have put charlie's details on the chat box so her um website phone number email address are there um as well as our details at Inspired Steps. We will be, um, I did mention this to everybody before, um, hopefully it's still the same for people who have joined the call afterwards. We will be editing this ever so slightly and getting it onto our YouTube channel. So you can find our YouTube channel at Inspired Steps CIC. Um, we will include Charlie's details again in this rerun of, of tonight's session. So um, please look there for any further information. Would it be helpful to those on the call and maybe others who couldn't make it tonight, if we had a, a part two with some other points, queries, comment sections, can we have a quick thumbs up if people might find that that's, that that's useful at some stage in the future? Yes, superb, okay then. What would be nice in the future was to actually just do, do one in real life in a park somewhere with a couple of dogs, that would be the best thing. Yeah. <laughs> so if that ever happens, I'm, I'm well up for that. Okay. <laughs> A bit of a bit of a dog get together, um, dog and owner get together. So yes, we we will try that. We've got time for probably one more quick question. Dad, have you got one? 
just a quick one, really, just about maybe it's part two. Yeah. Um, could we direct any, because sometimes your brain doesn't work. Could we direct any questions that we might have beforehand to you, yes. for yes. Charlie yes. to talk about on that particular yeah. part? Yeah. yeah, I think that'd be really helpful. Probably helpful for Charlie as well, because yeah, because because uh, yeah. some things I'm not, I'm not, like I said, I'm not, I'm not the expert on everything, and there's like, well, not at all. There's you know, there's things that will be vets' answers, behaviourists' answers, and I can probably go off and get some advice off other people and bring that in and and refer you to people that are specialists if there's something in particular that's causing an issue. So I can act as a like a referrer as well if if there's things that I can't answer. Yeah, that would be really helpful. So if people want to fire in any questions to um, if, if any of you have seen the flyer, you'll have inspired steps details there, uh, our website, our email address, phone them through. We can then collate them, get them to Charlie in advance. It's going to help Charlie as well, because as she said a couple of times, no one's professing to know everything and, and maybe a bit of time to prepare is going to is going to really help. One other thing that Charlie suggested is maybe next time for those who have got a dog, we can bring them online. And we can have our dogs sitting in and 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 giving our dogs a bit of TV exposure. Uh, I know I'm, I'm quite disappointed that there aren't any actually. But my, my dog normally joins us. He's normally like whining as soon as he hears me talking. So I'm quite surprised he hasn't uh, <laughs> hasn't appeared. So yeah, I could see on the line. I know that there are a few dog owners. So maybe next time we, we can we can have them parade themselves on the screen for <laughs> for a time. Um, Mine's well, so, got locked down here though. Has he really <laughs> joined the club? He's joining the club. Everyone be so loud at the moment, just to be looking slightly, um, slight, slight, slightly less groomed than usual. It's a bit of a hairball at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'll see how we go. We'll see how we go. So, um, I know we've run over a little bit, but thank you so much. Thank you so much um, for your points. Um, Theo, I've just noticed your question on, on the chat. Um, is, this your, is this your question? Because we're not going to be able to pick these up. These look like very strong dogs you're going for there. Um, and this is some information on specific dogs. So about Mastiff breeds, uh, Bull Boyle, Cane Corsos in particular. So um, Theo, is this something you'd be happy with us looking at next time, maybe looking at some specific dog breeds and possibly yeah. Charlie or someone else? coming in at what, what what some of the characteristics might be, bearing in mind what was said very early on, that each dog, even though it might have some traits, the actual yeah. character of each dog might be different. This was a question for next time, to be fair. So that's okay. fine. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you for that, Theo. Um, so we'd just like to thank you, Charlie. Um, I know we dropped you in at the deep end, throwing loads of stuff at you. Probably have destroyed your well scripted presentation with no, no it wasn't it wasn't well scripted i just hope i haven't like you know i, I just yeah, it's difficult so there's, there's so much information and there's yeah. so many things it's quite hard to kind of yeah get it all in into one presentation well can we see was it a thumbs up can we give a thumbs up if it was well worth well worth the hour spent thumbs up all the way along <laughs> yeah, thank you for <laughs> sharing it and being here and listening thank you Thank you so much. So um, a quick announcement. We will reposition another one. Um, we've probably got the next four or five weeks already scheduled out of these Let's Talk sessions. Um, we're, we're, we're really trying hard not to mention the C word and the V word. So these Let's Talk about are safe space to avoid all the other stuff we seem to be doing in or going on about in the world. So we've got a range of sessions. Next week, we are back on football. Um, um, the week after that is something else. We're doing music. We're doing um, cricket. Um, um, we're doing one on grief. Um, there's a lot of people who are going through a lot of stuff and just want an opportunity to air in a safe space. So please keep a look on our either our websites or our Facebook page, and we will continue to populate these and let you know. Sometimes um, it might not even be a subject you're necessarily uh, you you think you've got an interest in, but you will always pick up something new. I'm sure from tonight we've picked up loads of information. So if you've ever got an hour spare on a Tuesday evening and you want to just have a chat. Without C and V being present, then then please join us at eight o'clock on a Tuesday. So we will wish you good night. Once again, thanks thanks for being part of it, and um, wish you a good week, and, and maybe see you again uh, very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Then. Have a good evening. You take care. Bye.